Okay, so let's start right at the beginning. Speed is everything. What is the absolute first time-based action for a patient with suspected ACS? The first goal is a rapid diagnosis. You must acquire and interpret a 12-lead electrocardiogram, or ECG. And the time frame for that? Within 10 minutes of first medical contact, that is the first hurdle you have to clear. 10 minutes is incredibly fast, especially if you're in the field. What if that first ECG is um, inconclusive? but the patient looks sick. That's a great point. If your clinical suspicion is still high, but the reading is non-diagnostic, you have to do serial ECGs. You can't just stop there. Ischemia is a dynamic process. Right. Now let's pivot to a confirmed ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, a STEMI. The patient goes straight to a PCI-capable center. What is the single most important metric there? That would be the first medical contact to device time. The target is 90 minutes or less. 90 minutes. And that covers everything from the moment you first see the patient. To the moment the balloon is inflated in the blocked artery. Yeah. Yes, the entire sequence. That is an incredibly tight window. It requires a perfect system. Now, let's say the patient arrives at the emergency department. Do we need another ECG? You do. There's a second requirement. You have to get and interpret a new ECG within 10 minutes of their arrival. Okay, why have the second one? It confirms the initial findings, it can catch any new changes, and it's the final trigger to get the cath lab team moving. Makes sense. Let's talk biomarkers. Troponin timing feels like it's changed a lot recently. If that first troponin is negative or equivocal, when do you recheck it? It really depends on the type of assay your facility uses. If you have high sensitivity troponin assays, you repeat in one to two hours. A very short window. Very, but if you're using the older conventional troponin assays, that window is wider, more like three to six hours. Is there ever a case where you'd wait for troponin results before acting? For a STEMI, absolutely <laughs> not. Let me be perfectly clear on this. STEMI reperfusion should never ever be delayed waiting for biomarker results. The ECG is king. Let's get specific about that ECG. What are the actual numbers, the millimeters of ST elevation in leads V2 and V3 that define a STEMI? Okay, so you measure this at the J point and it differs by age and sex. For men who are 40 years or older, you need ST elevation of two millimeters or greater. But it's different for younger men. It is, the bar is higher. For men under 40, it's 2.5 millimeters or greater. And for female patients, what's the threshold in V2 and V3 for them? For women, it doesn't matter what their age is. The ST elevation threshold is 1.5 millimeters or greater. It's so important to know these specific cutoffs. Okay, so diagnosis is confirmed. Now we have to stratify risk. Let's talk about the GRACE score. What variables actually go into it? The GRACE score is so important because it predicts, you know, everything up to three-year mortality. It looks at age, kilip class, blood pressure, heart rate. ST deviation, cardiac arrest, creatinine, and biomarkers. So it's a really holistic view. It is. It gives you immediate and long-term risk. And how does that risk score guide what you do for a patient with NSTE ACS, so a non-ST elevation event? It dictates the timing of your intervention. If a patient is intermediate or high risk, they get a routine invasive approach. But if they're low risk... For low-risk patients, you have another option. You can go with a selective invasive approach. Which means? It means you can use non-invasive testing first, like a stress test, to decide if they really need to go to the cath lab. Got it. Let's go back to STEMI logistics. <laughs> a patient shows up at a hospital that can't do a percutaneous coronary intervention. They need a transfer. What's the maximum allowed FMC to device time in that case? That time window expands, but not by much. The maximum is 120 minutes or less. From first contact to device inflation at the second hospital. Yes, every part of that transfer has to be incredibly efficient. And if you just can't make that 120 minute goal. Then the whole strategy changes. You have to consider pharmacologic reperfusion. Fibrinolytic therapy. What are the strict criteria to start that? Two things have to be true. The patient's symptoms started within the last 12 hours and the delay from first medical contact to PCI is gonna be more than 120 minutes. Any ECG findings that are an absolute no-go for fibrinolyticates? Yes. You should never give it for ST segment depression alone. The only uh, rare exception is if you strongly suspect a posterior STEMI. Okay, so the patient gets the fibrinolytic therapy, it works. What's next? Do they still need to go to the cath lab? They do, they need immediate transfer to a PCI-capable center. Then you perform angiography between 2 and 24 hours after the fibrinolysis. That's a key change. Not waiting days. Not anymore. It's early angiography. Let's switch back to NSTE ACS. You mentioned a routine invasive approach. Let's break that down. What defines an early invasive strategy? 
An early invasive strategy means you intervene within 24 hours. This is for your high-risk patients. Huh? Think a grease score over 140, dynamic ST changes, or rapidly rising troponins. And what would push you to go even faster for an immediate invasive strategy? That's for the truly unstable patient. You have to get to the cath lab within two hours if they have refractory angina, hemodynamic instability, or life-threatening arrhythmias, a hard two-hour limit. Now let's get into the medications that start the moment they arrive. Right, the foundational therapies. Let's begin with aspirin. What are the loading and maintenance doses? The initial oral loading dose is 162 to 325 milligrams. After that, it's a daily maintenance dose of 75 to 100 milligrams. Okay, and for dual antiplatelet therapy, after a patient has received fibrinolytics, which PTOY12 inhibitor is the one to use. For post-fibrinolysis, the recommendation is clopidogrel. And the dosing here is really critical, and it depends on age. How so? Patients under 75 years old get a 300 milligram loading dose, but patients 75 or older, they get no loading dose. Straight to maintenance. Straight to the 75 milligram daily dose. It's a huge safety measure to lower bleeding risk in older patients. Let's talk about oxygen. Used to be given to everyone with chest pain. What's the actual numerical threshold now? We just don't give it routinely anymore. Oxygen is only recommended for confirmed hypoxia, and that's defined as an oxygen saturation, an O2 sat of less than 90%. And if they're at 90% or higher? No benefit. There's even a potential for harm through coronary vasoconstriction, so we don't do it. Okay, let's move into the cath lab. There have been some big procedural shifts. What's the preferred vascular access site now for PCI? It's the radial approach through the wrist. The evidence is just overwhelming that it reduces bleeding and major vascular complications compared to the femoral approach. What about pulling clot out of the artery? Is aspiration thrombectomy still standard practice? No, and this is a really important change. Routine manual aspiration thrombectomy should not be performed in STEMI patients. The major trials showed no benefit. Okay, let's talk about a patient with multivessel disease. Yeah. They're stable, they've had a STEMI, but they have other significant blockages. What do you do? For a stable patient, the recommendation is now to perform PCI on those other significant non-infarct arteries. Complete revascularization. During the same procedure? It can be. Either during the index procedure or you can stage it before they go home. It reduces future death or MI. But what about the sickest patients, those in cardiogenic shock? How does the strategy change then? It's the complete opposite. In cardiogenic shock, you only revascularize the culprit vessel the one causing the heart attack. You don't touch the other arteries? You do not. Routine PCI of a non-infarct artery in that setting should not be done. It just adds risk without any proven benefit in that acute phase. All right, and what about mechanical support for those shock patients? The intra-aortic balloon pump used to be standard. It's not recommended for routine use anymore. The IABP is out. So what's in? For select patients with severe refractory cardiogenic shock, inserting a microaxial intravascular flow pump, like an Impella device, is considered reasonable. It's a shift toward more powerful support for the right patient. As we get closer to discharge, what's the one mandatory assessment of heart function that every ACS patient needs? You have to assess their left ventricular ejection fraction, or LVEF, before they leave the hospital. It's foundational for guiding future therapies. Let's talk lipids. What are the hard numbers for LDL cholesterol that tell you to add a non-statin agent? So if a patient is on a maximally tolerated statin and their LDL cholesterol is still 70 milligrams per deciliter or greater, it is recommended you add a non-statin agent. And what if it's a little lower than 70? If the LDL is between 55 and 69, it's considered reasonable to add one, and then you have to recheck that lipid panel in four to eight weeks. Good. What about the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy, or DAPT, for a standard patient without a high bleeding risk? The default duration is at least 12 months. That's the standard to reduce the risk of stent thrombosis. And what if that patient also needs to be on a long-term oral anticoagulant, that triple therapy risk? Right, that's a high-risk scenario for bleeding. In that case, you discontinue the aspirin, usually after one to four weeks. So they continue on just two drugs. Exactly. The oral anticoagulant and a P2Y12 inhibitor. And in that situation, clopidogrel is the preferred one to use. Lastly, what's the one essential non-drug referral that has to be made for every single ACS patient before they go home? Every patient must be referred to an outpatient cardiac rehabilitation program. It has a significant impact on long-term outcomes, and home-based rehab is a good alternative if there are access issues.
So if we pull all of this together, mm. we've covered a huge amount of data. The 90-minute PCI goal, mm. the specific ST elevation numbers, the move away from routine aspiration thrombectomy, it's a lot. I mean, the core message is that adhering to these guidelines saves lives. It's all about metrics. The 10-minute ECG, the gray score, the lipid targets. But it's also about nuance knowing when to be aggressive with complete revascularization and when to pull back to culprit-only PCI in shock. Beyond mastering everything we've talked about, Preventative care is just as critical for long-term survival. There's growing evidence for things like low-dose chronic colchicine and mandating an annual flu shot. These really highlight the comprehensive approach you need for this population. So as you go into your next shift, what single time-sensitive metric we discuss will you focus on to streamline your patient care?